que ela se mexeu por aí. Ok. Oi. Ok, so, we've got a new chapter, nutrition, uh, nutrition chapter. And these uh, are the, uh, these are the people who are going to uh, take exam 4A. I'm making that one a uh, extra credit uh, optional exam, uh, nutrition. So let's talk about body weight and energy balance. Um, wait a minute. Let me make that, turn on the slideshow. Uh, so it's a pretty simple equation. Uh, you, uh, you have a metabolic rate, uh, you need a certain number of calories per day, and uh, if you eat that number of calories uh, per day, you maintain your weight. If you eat uh, fewer calories than that, you will lose weight, and if you eat more, you'll gain weight. It seems like a simple equation, but it's not that, not that simple. And uh, so energy balance. So as I uh, mentioned, we have a certain metabolic rate. Uh, you need a certain number of calories, uh, and we'll define what a calorie is a little later on, uh, every day in order to maintain the weight, to stay alive and maintain the weight. Uh, the average number is 2,000. Uh, it's, um, it's variable all over the place uh, for uh, uh, everybody. What's called basal metabolic rate, that is how much uh, calories do you have to take in each day just to stay alive. That's called basal metabolic rate. And that's dependent upon a lot of things. One of the things is uh, genetics, uh, who your parents were and what their metabolic rates were. Um, what, what alleles did they pass on uh, to you? Um, other things that affect it are, uh, is your gender. Uh, males have a higher metabolic rate uh, than females. Um, your age, uh, the older you are, the slower your metabolic your basal metabolic rate, uh, the fewer calories you need. Um, that's why we tend to put on weight a little bit when we get a little older because we usually don't change our eating habits, uh, but our metabolic rate is low, so we may tend to put on weight. Um, you, unfortunately, your size affects it. The, the larger you are, the lower your metabolic rate because one of the things basal metabolic rate uh, does is maintain your body temperature. And uh, you have a much smaller surface uh, uh, area to lose weight the larger you are, and so therefore the lower metabolic rate you need to maintain your body temperature. So that's part of what metabolic rate is, basal metabolic rate. And that's set pretty much in stone depending upon your gender, your age, your genetics. Um, then, um, then there's what's called the metabolic cost of food. How much uh, uh, it takes ATP to actually digest and, and put away food and, and everything. So that's, and that, that's a pretty small part and, um, uh, and that's really not variable. Uh, and your BMR is not variable. Uh, but with, what uh, the biggest part of metabolic rate uh, or um, the most variable part is physical activity. Uh, I, uh, do you not move around a lot? Are you a couch potato? Well, then your metabolic rate is going to be lower. And somebody else is out there jogging and hike or hiking or doing exercises or moving around a lot. Uh, so that's different for every, every, every person. Uh, the more you move around, uh, uh, the more calories you're going to need to maintain your weight. Okay. And our energy balance is. Um, is um, regulated by an area in the hypothalamus. This will be on the next slide, I think, uh, called the auricular nucleus. You have the This is your satiety center. This tells you uh, when you're hungry and when you're full. And it's done so hormonally. And these are good to, uh, to uh, look at because the book really doesn't talk very much about, about these. And some of these are fairly new. Uh, like Jarelin, I mentioned Jarelin in the last chapter from the stomach, um, and it's the uh, it's a hunger signal. Uh, it tells you you're hungry, um, and it doesn't matter uh, 
how large you are, how much food you have stored away, you're going to get hungry. Um, the other ones, uh, and that's a short-term regulator. Um, the other short-term regulator, peptide YY and cholestokinin, are actually satiety signals. Uh, they tell you that you're full. Time to push yourself away from the table, you're full. Um, and peptide YY is from, I think, of uh, a full uh, intestine. Uh, intestines that have stretched, uh, put out peptide YY. It goes to your hemodialysis and tells you you've eaten enough. Uh, cholestokinin, remember, is secreted also by a small intestine. Its, its biggest role is to slow down the stomach activity in the intestinal uh, phase of uh, stomach empty. Uh, it also contracts the gallbladder, but it also feeds back upon your brain and tells you you're full. Long term regulators are leptin and insulin. Leptin is made by adipose tissue, and that also tells your brain you're full. It's a weak signal as far as that goes. Mostly leptin is a signal to tell your brain how much fat you have. The more fat you have, the more leptin you make. And your body really needs to know how much, how much fat it has. It's particularly important for women uh, because women may, uh, may need to supply uh, you know, food for another human being. Uh, and you have, enough to have enough, you have to have enough fat to do that. Um, also, insulin is interesting. It is also a, um, uh, a satiety signal. Um, because we learn that, uh, that after you've eaten, uh, you make lots of insulin. Uh, and, this is good. and the more you eat, the more in insulin you make, and the more it turns off your brain. OK, that tells you you're full. All right. So hunger. Um, Empty stomach contractions of an empty stomach, um, uh, chewing, swallowing, filling stomach uh, will help uh, allay that hunger. The stimulus for certain individual foods is appetite, certain foods. Uh, epinephrine will stimulate your, uh, um, make you hungry for carbohydrates. That makes sense because it's a fight or flight hormone, and carbos is quick immediate energy. Um, gallonin is another thing that, that stimulates you to, uh, I think it's a, uh, a peptide uh, that will st uh, stimulate you uh, to have an appetite for fatty foods. Endorphins stimulate protein, uh, your uh, desire for protein. So calorie. Uh, definition. It's, uh, it's the amount of uh, heat it takes to raise one milliliter of water one degree Celsius. So it's a really tiny um, unit. Uh, and it's a unit of heat. But remember, uh, it's important to realize that all of the food that comes into your uh, body, that's energy you take into your body, eventually, uh, so, some of it's going to be uh, just come off as heat. Because in the breakdown and making ATP, you, uh, you release heat. Uh, every time you, s you, you move electrons from one molecule to another, you lose some of that energy as heat. And even the, the energy that you store in ATP and use it to do work will eventually leave your body as heat. Every bit of energy that comes into your body eventually loses heat. So we measure uh, you know, energy in terms of heat. Calories are measured heat. All right, now the calories such a small unit, and people's basal metabolic rate is usually uh, it is high enough where they you have to use really big numbers to describe it. So what we generally talk about when we talk about calories are called kilocalories, thousand of those small calories is a kilocal or kcal or calorie with a big C. So if you see ca uh, calories on a food label, for example, it's really a kcal. And so the average person needs 2,000 calories a day to maintain uh, their, their body weight. Uh, and that, like I said, that, that means absolutely nothing to you because uh, there's a whole range of, of uh, 
base of anabolic rates all the way from 1,000. Some people can get, a, get, get a, away with 1,000 calories a day. Other, uh, other people need 3,000 calories a day if they have an efficient mechanism. So it's a range. It's a belt shaped curve. Okay, 2,000 in the middle. But in food labels, they have to use you know, some measurement to, uh, uh, to uh, set guidelines. And so they use the average um, of 2,000. Okay. So the arc rate nucleus of hepatitis. Um, there's a bunch of uh, neurons that are called the NPY secreting neurons, and they stimulate eating. There's another group of neurons called the melanocortin secreting neurons, and they stimulate feeling of satiety or fullness. And some of these uh, hormones I'm going to talk about, durelin, peptide YY, and um, and cholestochine are called gut, gut brain peptides. They're made in, they're secreted, made and secreted in the gut, uh, in the GI tract, and they, uh, uh, their, their target uh, cells are in the arc rate nucleus of the uh, hypothalamus, the satiety center. So as I mentioned, appetite stimulating, duralin, appetite suppressing, CCK, PYY, leptin, Instant. Interestingly, that there's more appetite suppressing uh, signals than appetite uh, in heat, stimulating. There's only one, Torelli. You think in, in you know, hunter gatherer days, we want more uh, appetite stimulating uh, hormones, but we only have one. Okay. This is important to look at this, and it's not real uh, clear, but I think you can read it. Uh, we have uh, pancreas secreting insulin, stomach secreting durelin, um, small intestine secreting PYYCCK uh, leptin. Um, no, no, actually, leptin, that, that's wrong. I, well, I think that leptin comes from adipose tissue. I think that's uh, wrong. When we talk about leptin, it comes from adipose tissue. PYY from large intestine also. And notice how durelin is going to the NP1 secreting uh, neurons and stimulates those to stimulate uh, appetite, to stimulate hunger. Um, all the rest, um, all the uh, um, appetite suppressing hormones, with the exception of leptin, actually don't really directly stimulate satiety. They inhibit the NP1 secreting neurons. So they move like an inhibit hunger and stimulate satiety. But of course, that's the same thing. And the, uh, and the NPY secret neurons can inhibit the melanocortin secret neurons. But leptin does do both. Leptin both inhibits hunger, but directly stimulates the satiety because it directly stimulates the melanocortin um, secret neurons. Uh, OK. So obesity, we can talk about uh, 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 really, really heavy uh, and the body mass index. Uh, I think everybody knows what the BMI is and uh, you've seen, I'm gonna put up uh, the actual uh, chart here, I think in the next slide, um, measurement of, of uh, versus just overweight, healthy weight or underweight. So there's three, well, actually there's three categories, underweight, normal, or so-called healthy weight, overweight, obese, and now there's another one beyond that called morbidly obese. Uh, and it has a, it's got a good indication, but it, there's limitations of it, and we'll talk about that. And the causes of the, some causes of obesity, it's not really, you know, just eating too much. Um, there's, there's a lot of causes for it. One of them is, is genetics. But some people are just naturally heavier than others. And we can talk about um, that. Uh, this wasn't in this chapter, but I think it was uh, when I was teaching uh, nutrition. Talk about why, why do you have this particular body weight? And your particular natural body weight, if you 
uh, you know, heavier or uh, uh, greater or less than somebody else's just natural body weight. Uh, we have a certain um, body weight that we sort of defend. And uh, there's a couple of theories about why that is. Uh, some think it's just a set point. You know, our, our brain thinks we should weigh this amount. And we sort of, uh, and it sort of directs us to eat or not to eat to maintain that particular weight. Um, um, some people uh, think it's, it's due to our evolutionary history that we, what, that we always, it used to be really, really hard to find food. We were hunter gatherers, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we we're hunter gatherers. And it really tough to find galleries out there. And so the stimulation to be really have a really efficient metabolic rates. If you have a really efficient metabolic rates, you can get along um, uh, uh, with less food than the next guy. This is called the thrifty gene theory, where and we went through a selective filter because there was always huge times of famine in our evolutionary history. And if you could get a and so who's going to make it through these 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 times of famine? People with really efficient metabolic rates and only need a certain amount of food. Uh, somebody else needs 3,000 calories a day, you can get a lot of weight on 1,000. Who's going to be the first to starve to death? The guy who needs 3,000. He's going to die, he's not going to have sex, and pass on those, those inefficient genes. The person who has an efficient metabolic rate can get away with the smallest amount of food and still survive. It's going to be able to make, uh, have sex, make babies, and pass on those genes. Okay. Well, but also there's lifestyle choices, sedentary lifestyle. You know, we used to uh, be really, really active. We have to be really, really active in, in the jobs that we do and finding food and taking care of things. And uh, now, you know, we sit, we sit down at a desk. Uh, you know, most people work by sitting behind a desk, so it was a center left. Our portion sizes, snack culture, entertainment. You know, why do you eat? Sometimes people just eat because it makes them feel better, or it's, or it's time to eat, or uh, I'm bored and I'd rather just eat. Um, portion sizes have gotten much larger. Um, uh, we have a particular snack culture. We go into a grocery store and there's whole rows of snack food um, that's there. Um, and a natural selection, we just mentioned that. Natural selection, we went through selective filters. Every famine over the course of history was a selective filter to be have a really efficient metabolic rate. Okay. Here's the body mass index. It's really a measure of how much you weigh versus how much you, uh, how, uh, what your height is, right? And so you go over to get your height in feet and inches and you move over to weight in pounds, uh, how much you weigh in pounds. Um, so uh, if you're, uh, and so the blue is underweight and that can be uh, uh, dangerous as well. The, 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 the curve for you know, a risk of diseases is really J-shaped. If you have a risk of some kind of disease and uh, your uh, BMI, uh, if you're underweight, you have, a, you have a higher risk of certain diseases. If you're, if you're healthy weight, you have the lowest risk. And the risk for uh, then disease increases as you get uh, overweight, obese, and morbidly obese. Um, so the healthy weight is in there in the middle in orange. Um, and then if you get into the green, you consider overweight. And that's usually not that big of a deal. Having a few extra pounds is, is uh, generally uh, not, that, uh, not, not, not that bad. It's, uh, and uh, said naturally, some people are just naturally gonna have a larger frames, uh, have more weight than somebody else. But then if they get above 30, then that's supposed to be in uh, obese, you know, clinically uh, or not clinically, but uh, technically obese, according to this, they're obese. Um, and now there's a new category, which you don't have on there, uh, above, uh, a BMI above 40 is called morbidly obese. And that is really uh, heavy. 
And because here's the thing, um, when you get into our storage um, molecules, uh, what molecules that we, that we uh, store in our body to provide calories uh, if we're not eating? Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a carbohydrate one called glycogen. And this has, so I think of, I talk about gas tanks. We have a glycogen gas tank. It's our storage carbohydrate for animal starch. And we have a certain limited size. The gas tank is only a certain size. Um, I think like a gas tank in your car. You can't overfill your, ga your gas tank in your car. Um, and then we use that over the course of the day. And then, every, and then in our meals, we re Fill that gas tank. Uh, then our other storage uh, uh, food molecule is triglyceride, fat. And um, so we store that. But how big is the fat gas tank? It's unlimited. There, there is no limit. Uh, it's, a, it's infinite. Uh, you can put, uh, put on um, as much fat as you, as, as you can. That's why we have people who are a thousand pounds. And have to be uh, uh, forklifted out of their houses to bring them to the hospital. Um, crane, have to put, use a crane to lift them uh, because there's no limit to, to your fat storage tank, uh, your fat gas tank. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to define nutrients and talk about different ways of uh, classifying nutrients. So what is a nutrient? A nutrient is anything you uh, need uh, every day to keep yourself alive. <laughs> That's what nutrient uh, is, right? Um, and, um, and then we can start classifying that in different ways. One is how much of this do you need every day? Every, every day to stay alive and to maintain your weight. So macronutrient is when you need, you know, multiple gram quantities uh, in the course of a day. Um, micronutrients are things you might need much smaller amounts. And uh, some, uh, like milligram quantities, sometimes nanogram quantities, where they're really trace elements, you need tiny amounts, and it's called micronutrients. You can also, classify nutrients as energy yielding nutrients or non-energy yielding nutrients. Energy yielding are the molecules that we eat that we can make ATP from, uh, that are caloric, right? And all of the uh, macronutrients um, are uh, energy yielding, uh, except for water. Um, we have to take multiple gram quantities of water, but we don't get energy from, from water. Okay. Then we have what's called a recommended daily allowances. This is what is, what nutritionists uh, think that you, how much of this nutrient you should get every day. And uh, this is, uh, and actually uh, how many of a, how much of a particular nutrient you need not just the energy yield, but it's, you know, how many calories you need every day to, to maintain your weight, but also like vitamins and things. How much, how, how much of these vitamins do you need? Well, it's variable for different people. It's from the bell-shaped curve too. So what nutritionists do to set the RDAs is, uh, they don't want to uh, give you the, uh, set the RDA at the, at the mean amount that uh, people need. Because that would mean they're giving you an amount that for half the people out there, that's not enough. You should, you should, you should have more. So what they do is they move over to like 80%. What are like 80% of, of, of people need at least this much in order to maintain their health? Um, that means there's only like, uh, or maybe even 85. So it's only 15 or 20% of people out there actually need a little bit more. So they go way over on the on the uh, on the high side of the curve, just to make sure that most people get uh, as much nutrients as, as they want. And there's usually not too much danger there, because the uh, for most of these nutrients, 
take a more than you need and it's not harmful. Uh, uh, that's called the upward tolerable limit. Uh, for most of these nutrients, it's, it's really high. So you could take uh, huge doses and uh, it's not going to hurt. Like vitamin C, for example, you could take me me mega doses of vitamin C and it's not going to hurt. Essential nutrients. Now this is something um, that uh, has a particularly specific definition in nutrition. Because uh, normally we talk about essential is something you need. Right? Uh, and uh, so in, in that sense, all nutrients are essential. Because it, that's what the definition is. The, the things you need to take in your body every day, keep yourself alive and maintain you. Um, but, we but when we talk about specific nutrients, uh, what we mean when we say essential nutrients is a nutrient that you can't make. Your body can't make this stuff. So you have to get it from the outside every day, right? Well, either that, either you can't make it or your body can make it, but not enough uh, to keep you alive. Water is a, gr a great example. Is water an essential nutrient? Well, yes, even though we make this stuff, but we need, uh, like they usually talk about six to eight uh, glasses of water a day, uh, not to become dehydrated, but we only make about 200 milliliters of metabolic water a day. So that's not nearly enough. So, you know, that's an essential nutrient. Uh, versus something like vitamin C, where we can't make any vitamin C at all. So that's essential nutrient because we, we can't make it at all. We have to get it from the outside. Okay, so the macronutrients, carbohydrates, lipids, protein, these are the energy yielding ones. And water, water is a macronutrient. Uh, and also a couple of ions are. Now, when we get to ions and elements, generally, generally those are micronutrients. But when we get to things like sodium and potassium, they're actually could be considered macro uh, because you're supposed to get like a gram and a half of sodium a day and, and like almost uh, about four and a half grams of potassium a day. Most of us don't get that much. Uh, so you could possibly put it in a macro, but we're not going to. We're going to keep those micronutrients even though technically you do need multiple grand quantities. So micro, we're usually gonna, uh, we're going to uh, uh, put vitamin and minerals in the category of micronutrients. So, most nutritionists uh, suggest you get 40 to 50% of your caloric intake every day from carbohydrates. And remember, carbohydrates are polymers of sugar. Um, and uh, carbohydrates are so important because uh, they, like I said, they're polymers of sugar, and they're actually polymers of one particular sugar, glucose. Uh, which is the most important uh, sugar as far as human nutrition goes, it's blood sugar. And, um, and what's really important about it is your brain has to have it. It's really kind of a flaw in our physiology that our brain absolutely has to have glucose. It can live off of these fat byproduct called ketones a little bit, but it ha still has to have glucose. And that's why Gluco blood glucose is a homeostatic variable. It it's never changes because your brain has to have it. So I was going to ask, what happens to your blood glucose if you don't eat any carbohydrates? Well, nothing. What happens to your blood glucose if you don't eat for a couple of days? Well, nothing. Blood glucose is like body temperatures, like blood pH. It's absolutely homeostatic. Uh, it's always the same, right? Varies by tiny bits and over the course of the day because the big guy has to have it. 
Uh, so the caloric value of carbohydrates is four kcals per gram. Oh, four kcals per gram is um, so four big C calories uh, per gram uh, uh, for carbohydrates. Um, a simple versus complex. Um, I don't like uh, uh, calling uh, uh, mono and diglycerides simple carbohydrates, but they're called that in food labels. So they're simple. Right? Um, mono and disaccharides, like high fructose corn syrup. Polysaccharides, uh, they are long polymers of, of glucose, uh, starch, and cellulose are, uh, so these are called complex carbohydrates, and starch and, and cellulose are plant products. Uh, glycogen is very similar to starch, sometimes called animal starch. That's our storage carbohydrate. Uh, that, that, so, uh, that is stored in liver and in muscle. So dietary sources, primarily plants. That's where you get, that's where you get carbohydrates from. Um, I suppose if you ate meat, you might, there might be a little bit of glycogen in there if you're eating a piece of beef or chicken or something, but mostly it's plants is where we get uh, carbohydrates from. And uh, not all um, carbohydrates are caloric. Um, fiber is not. Uh, and that's uh, uh, insoluble fiber would be called, it's called cellulose. It's the, uh, it's, uh, the cell walls of, of uh, plant cells is cellulose. It is um, not digestible. Uh, you, it, um, you don't have the enzyme to break the bond uh, between it. It's called uh, um, beta bond, I think. Anyway, the bond between the glucoses in starch is one way. The bond between the glucose and cellulose is a different way. The, uh, the amylases can break the ones in starch. They can't break the ones in cellulose. So, for example, if you eat a stalk of celery, that's almost like 99.9% .9 cellulose. You're not getting any uh, deriving any uh, nutrient benefit from it. You are getting a benefit. We'll talk later on about the benefit of fiber, but it goes in looking one way, it comes out looking really different, but it's the same amount. Now you can break up a little bit by chewing, but as much as you want to, you can choose, you know, cellulose for days, and you're not going to break it down into individual monosaccharides. You can only do that with enzymes. Now, now, soluble fiber is things called pectins and um, and gums and mucilages. These are found in uh, some vegetables, but particularly found in fruits. And they, uh, uh, again, they are uh, uh, smaller, called oligosaccharides, and uh, but we still can't break them down. But they are also healthy in a different way. So we're going to talk a later on about how soluble inside your fiber is healthy for you, even though you don't drive any nutrient benefit from it. Lipids. So you should uh, about thirty percent of your diet should be a, a consist of, of lipids or fat, and there are different types of, of lipids. The only real thing they have in common is they're all really hydrophobic. So the carbohydrates and are hydrophilic, the lipids are hydrophobic. And uh, the major, when we say fat, we usually mean that first one, triglycerides. That's dietary fat, right? The fat that's around the steak or underneath the chicken skin, this is triglycerides. Uh, there's also phospholipids, it's similar to a, a triglyceride, but it has a big phosphate group on it, and it's a and it's a sort of what's called an infopathic molecule. It is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, and it's the main molecule found in cell membranes. So it's an important molecule. Uh, and then steroids. This generally we don't we don't so we don't derive any 
caloric benefit from phospholipids or steroids. Steroids are uh, uh, cholesterol, um, you know, the, uh, but, but it's important. Um, uh, steroids are important molecules, but uh, we don't have to really eat them. We can make them. Uh, they're not essential nutrients. Um, now, the triglycerides are made up of a molecule called glycerol and three fatty acids. Now, some fatty acids are essential nutrients. They're called the omega fatty acids. We're going to get to those. Uh, it's the ideal long term storage form for, um, for us. Uh, putting away um, calories for, for, for uh, times when we can't uh, eat. Um, it's, it's the highest caloric value of anything else, nine kcals per gram. Uh, it's hydrophobic, so you can pack it together real tight. Uh, glycogen, you got to store in water, it's hydrophilic. But fat pushed away, you can pack it together real, uh, real close, and it's a really great uh, uh, long term storage for, form. Fat also does other important things for you. It cushions organs, provides insulation for both thermal insulation and for insulation around nerves. Uh, so uh, lipids are important for that too, not only just uh, the, the caloric value. Well, like I said, they're ideal long-term storage form because they're hydrophobic and they have the highest k calorie range. Uh, and they have glucose and protein sparing effects. Um, so if you're running low on, on glycogen, running low on glucose, uh, then your brain gets a little worried uh, and, uh, and uh, the uh, pancreas turns off insulin and uh, you start living off of fat. In fact, the longer you go without eating, the less, uh, the, the more and more you use fat. Um, so it spares the glucose for your brain and also spares protein because if you run really uh, low on glucose, you're gonna have to start breaking down amino acids to make glucose to keep your brain alive. So if you got a lot, uh, so if you can use fat, it spares the glucose, it spares the protein, but you must break it down protein. Uh, so lipids also uh, fat soluble vitamins. We have uh, water soluble vitamins um, and uh, uh, fat soluble vitamins. Um, the water solubles are generally the B, all the Bs, and the C. And C fat solubles are uh, A, D, E, and K. So and, and you usually find these fat soluble vitamins in fat. It's one of the good things about eating fat uh, is that you get the fat soluble vitamins. Structural components of cell membranes and myelin, as I mentioned, phospholipids uh, are the uh, major molecule in cell membranes. Myelin uh, is insulation on uh, axons, and that's uh, a type of fat. Is essential fatty acids, ones we cannot make. They're called the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. These we eat every day and generally find those in fatty fish. It's one of the reasons why fish and fish oil is so, is so healthy because it has a lot of, of these essential fatty acids. They're also found in flax seeds. For the vegetarians, they're found in flax seeds. Okay. And they are needed to make eicosanoids. And you know what the eicosanoids are? Prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and nucleotriates. You need omega uh, uh, fatty acids to make those. So uh, uh, saturated uh, fat is uh, fatty acids that have uh, all single bonds, you know, saturated hydrogen. And you find those in animals. Animal fats uh, are generally saturated. The unsaturated ones 
found in uh, plates. Plate, uh, that's why uh, plate rolls are, uh, uh, remember, are liquid at room temperature and saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Uh, and saturated fats are known since the 50s. Uh, they uh, link to risk for heart disease, cancer, and diabetes mellitus. Uh, cholesterol is a non-essential nutrient. It's not found in plant products, you know, uh, but uh, so you can eat a completely cholesterol-free diet and you don't have to worry about it. And cholesterol is important um, for making um, uh, the steroid hormones. And it's also important to keep our, it's, it's important uh, molecule in cell membranes. Also, it's along with phospholipids. It keeps these um, cell membranes nice and fluid. Uh, uh, so it's an important uh, molecule there. Now, we're going to be talking about lipoproteins, how these uh, fats have to be carried in the, in the blood in little protein packages called lipoproteins. Um, it's four categories, chylomicrons, which we've already talked about. And then we're going to talk about high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, and very low density lipoprotein. And this is how fat is carried in the blood. Uh, I think I'm going to uh, stop right there because I think we've already had uh, long enough. And so I'm going to pick up on this uh, slide in the, next, in the next. So this is nutrition one, I'll pick it up in nutrition two. So I'll see you on the flip side.